is the, the legislation that they've put in place for climate change. And I think that's quite topical now, given that um, our, our own uh, uh, government is, is considering uh, climate legislation. It's, it's on the A-list, I believe, for this, uh, this term. So, um, so I'm delighted to welcome uh, John Ashton to speak. try with this microphone. Um, a housekeeping announcement to begin with. I'm speaking to you this morning through a, uh, an infected sinus and quite a, a heavy fog of some rather heavy duty medication. So um, if I, I guess there's two risks. One is that I sort of fade into a stupor and the other one, maybe more attractive, is that I fade into a kind of hallucinatory uh, state induced by the medication. Perhaps, Fionn, if I do either of those things, come and give me a kick and I will return to, <laughs> return to reality. But I hope you can both, uh, you can all hear me and, and see, me, uh, see me here. Um, I, I always, um, wherever I go in the world uh, and when I'm at home, I've always thought of myself as British, except when I come here. When I step off the plane in Dublin, I know that whether I like it or not, I'm English. Uh, and you know, you're laughing, you know that too. Um, and I've thought every time, because I love coming here, and I come here as often as I can, and um, I always feel at home here. I mean, I always feel English, so not my normal identity, but I always feel welcome and at home. And it's partly because whenever I come, the people who've brought me give me such generous and warm-hearted uh, hospitality. But it's not only that, and I've been sort of wondering about that for a long time. Uh, so I want to ask you um, a question just to sort of start off. Um, would anybody like to tell me where they think in England the Irish footprint is strongest? I'd be really interested in just what anybody want to volunteer. I, somebody said Kilburn to me last night. <laughs> somebody closely related to someone who's sitting in the audience. Where? where? Manchester, Liverpool. Liverpool, so sort of standard, and I can understand all of those answers. It, it, it's none of those places. No. Slough. No. <laughs> 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 I, <laughs> um, I live quite, not quite close to Slough, near, near the M4, but I'm not quite sure what footprint you would sort of <laughs> characterise Slough with. It, it's where I grew up. It's Northumberland. Um, I spent a day recently on Lindisfarne, and I swear to you, if you go somewhere quiet in Lindisfarne and shut your eyes, you can hear Irish voices, and if you really listen, you can probably hear the harp as well. Really, I'm not kidding, and that, because that's where St. Aidan came, and the, the Irish, uh, the Celtic saints, but starting with, with St. Aidan and his band of Irish monks, and that part of our country is such an important place because it was the cradle from which the English, the modern English imagination emerged. You had the Saxon power and then you had the collision between Celtic Christianity coming across from Ireland via Iona and Roman Christianity. Celtic Christianity, naturalistic, rooted in the people, non-hierarchical, Roman Christianity, bureaucratized, somewhat imperialistic. Uh, and there was, a, there was a conflict between those two views of the spiritual foundation of society. And you can still, certainly if you live there, you can still pick up the traces of that today. And I think, that, I think it's my origin in Northumberland that means actually that I have this feeling whenever I come here that I'm coming, uh, I'm coming home. So it's a curious mixture of feelings. I, I'm honored to be here, to be invited here today, and thank you very much for that. But I do also feel uh, feel at home uh, with you. I should just, you, you kindly um, uh, talked about what I used to be when you introduced me. I mean, I should sort of describe what I am, just so you can sort of calibrate what I'm saying. Um, yes, I am an escaped diplomat. In my distant past, I'm also an escaped astronomer. I was a theoretical 
physicist. It's my deep formation. Um, but nowadays, I'm a kind of itinerant pontificator. It's what I describe myself. Um, I go around speaking, and I speak because it's a good way of listening. And the reason I do that is because I think you can't fix the climate. And as Frank has just illustrated very calmly but seriously, we do need to fix the climate. I mean, I can tell you as an escaped diplomat, I do not want to be part of a more than two degree world because I don't understand how the stresses in the food system, in the water system, in the energy system, amplified by the climate system, I don't understand how those stresses can be made manageable above somewhere like two. It's not a kind of thing we need to do because it's nice to do. It's a thing we really have to do. Um, but I don't think you can fix the climate if you have broken politics. And I think we have broken politics at the moment. Uh, and that's why I do what I do. And I'll come, I'll come back to that. Um, and we're here today to discuss... Um, uh, I didn't start my stopwatch now, so I have to, have to uh, take off five minutes. <laughs> uh, to discuss climate technology opportunities. And um, the climate technology story is, a, is an enormously exciting uh, story, but we can only really understand it if we start from the right place. And it seems to me the right place is not climate change and the response to it. The right place is 2008 and the response to that. Because what happened in 2008 has unleashed extremely powerful forces, I would say historic forces. And I don't think any government uh, and any polity in Europe has begun to comprehend the significance of the forces and to work out what we need to do to manage those forces. And how we do that will put the limits on what we can do about climate change, what we can do about paying for water, what we can do about any political problem that we face. It will come out of how we understand and manage those post-2008 forces. So I'm gonna come back, uh, I'm gonna come back to those in a moment, but let's just quickly start with a kind of close-up view of the climate uh, technology agenda. I mean, first of all, a couple of misunderstandings. There are still people who talk about climate change as if it were an environmental problem climate, or a science problem. Climate change is not an environmental problem or a science problem. Climate change is a problem deep in the heart of the macroeconomic structure because the dependency that we have on fossil energy is the foundation of the economy. That's what the Industrial Revolution was about. It's wired in to the deep foundation of the economy. So if you want to get, which is what we need to do, I mean, the answer to, to um, Frank's challenge, you know, how do we do it? We need to get within a generation or so from a carbon intensive energy system to a carbon neutral energy system. If we don't do, I mean, there are other things we need to do as well to do with land use, for example, but if we don't do that energy thing, we will not have a chance of keeping climate change within two degrees. And that is about restructuring the deep foundation of the economy. And unless we start to build an economic story, a macroeconomic story, a structural economic story that addresses that, we won't even be sort of getting off the starting blocks. And we, we're not doing that uh, at the moment. Second misunderstanding, we often talk about climate change as if what we need to do is, can be expressed in terms of cutting emissions, and particularly annual cuts in emissions. How many percent do we need to cut this year or this decade? We've allowed the welfare economists to trap us into a cage, which is essentially about incrementalism. It's about marginal adjustments to business as usual. You cannot tell that deep macroeconomic story if you try and look at it from the point of view of marginal adjustments to business as usual. You have to tell a structural story. That's what it's about. You have to be really clear where you're going to get to, where you need to get, excuse me, where you need to get to, uh, and, and you need to be really clear about what the pieces of that jigsaw look like and how you're going to put them, uh, how you're going to put them together. Actually, if you do that, it seems to me, um, certainly at certain times in our history, 
it, the picture it paints is rather thrilling. If you, if you gave this challenge to the Victorians, to our English Victorians, they would have relished it. They would have absolutely relished it. Um, it's a story about electricity. It's a story about using electricity to do more things in smarter ways while taking carbon emissions uh, out of the electricity system. I've, I've got a friend called Bruce Cheng in Taiwan, who is the fa he's in his 90s now. He's the founder and chief executive of a company called Delta Electronics. Some of you may have heard of it. It may well have a presence in, in Ireland. It's a pretty successful multinational company. He started off making televisions out of thermionic diodes in his garage. He was an inventor and, and a kind of electrical, self-taught, autodidact electrical engineer, but a very, very talented one. And he built a company out of that. And when people started talking about climate change, he took some time out and he said, I want to get my head around this climate change issue. And he disappeared for six months and he came back and he told his company, now I understand what this is about. This is about uh, as I said, using electricity to do more things in smarter ways. And we are going to be the electrical engineering and electronics company that is selling the most ultra-efficient products and appliances that you can buy. And that's what he does. That's what they've been doing for the last 20 years. And that is why they're one of the world's most successful um, uh, companies in that, uh, in that sector. It's a story of renewable energy. Look what's happening with renewable energy in Germany. Uh, in Germany, you have, and I'll come back to this, you, you have a political context which has set out to accelerate the penetration of renewable energy in the electricity system. Uh, and you now have days when the total generated by renewables is over 60%. You have hours where it's over 100% of demand. And you can hear the sound of the business models of the big centralized fossil and nuclear-based utilities collapsing. The share prices of E.ON and RWE are now something like half what they were two or three years ago. They're getting really serious disruptive change uh, as the renewable technologies come down the cost curve in Germany. They're getting a sense of liberation because over half of the renewables that are now being installed in Germany are being installed in community-based electricity schemes, self-organized community-based schemes, which people are doing not primarily, actually, because they want to fix the climate, but because they want to free themselves from the evil power of the remote and exploitative utilities. We don't, we don't like our electricity utilities very much in the UK, but our antipathy towards our utilities is nothing compared with German. I don't quite understand why, incidentally, but, but they really hate their utilities uh, there. Um, and, you know, you'll hear a lot more about this through the day, but just run through the different pieces of the jigsaw, the transport piece. It, it's now clear that the, the dominance of the internal combustion engine is, is going to come to an end. The only issue is how, is how quickly. When I lived in China and when I was visiting China, I spent some time uh, listening to Chinese automobile companies, and I kept hearing... Essentially, we have Chinese colleagues in the group today, but I, I, a number of, of people from companies like uh, Shanghai Automotive um, would say to me, we're going to do to the global automotive industry what the Japanese did to Detroit, and we're going to do it on electric vehicles. And the investment going in, um, you've got the storage issue there and the excitement in Wall Street over the investment that Elon Musk is putting into a factory whose purpose is to drive down the cost of lithium-ion batteries just through scale. This is all about scale. This is not about inventing stuff that we don't have yet. This is about driving existing technologies down the cost curve through scale, by scaling up faster and using policy to, to facilitate that. Um, a, a number of sort of general points, though, about this transition. It's not really about technology. It's about infrastructure, because if you want to deploy technology faster, you need infrastructure platforms. And you need to be able to talk about how we're going to finance the construction of those infrastructure platforms. That's why in Britain, people talk about our Climate Change Act. And our Climate Change Act is, is quite an important piece of legislation, legally binding, five-year carbon. But if you're thinking of climate legislation in Ireland, I strongly recommend legally binding carbon budgets because that's where you get 
investors want certainty and that that provides a modicum of it's not all the certainty but it provides a modicum of certainty but actually the most significant climate policy that the British government has introduced in recent years is the creation of the Green Investment Bank which is essentially a state-backed infrastructure bank where the state is standing behind uh, financing for low carbon infrastructure and and therefore uh, I, I, I mean, leave aside the fact that our Treasury is trying very hard to kill it in the small print and, and confine it to being a fund rather than a bank. But if it really takes off as a bank, it will be in a position to leverage very large flows of private capital into low carbon infrastructure. Um, as I said, this isn't, you hear a lot of the debate and a lot of the vested interest, the people who say, actually, you know, you're, you're asking us to go too fast because these technologies cost too much. They're trying to focus you on the, on the present cost of, of technologies. The present cost is almost irrelevant. What matters is the cost curves. What do the cost curves look like? How steep are they? And how fast can you push down those cost curves? The solar PV story is a very good example of that. So what's it going to cost in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years? Deutsche Bank has just put out a report saying that you will have grid parity for solar PV in America in 47 out of 50 states by 2016. If you thought the banks were the only kind of company that's too big to fail, wait until the utilities really start screaming about that. They already are in America, beginning to. How can you possibly do this? They're losing their credit ratings, their business models are fragmenting. Um, this is going to be very disruptive, which comes back to politics, and I'll come back, I'll come back to that. It's not, I mean, in a way, while being honored to be here and feeling welcome here, I sort of object to the framing of this conversation. It's not about climate technology. Climate technology isn't a, a little sort of subset of the economy as a whole. Climate technology is the whole economy. There is nothing that happens in the economy that doesn't have an energy footprint or a carbon footprint of some kind. So if you want to, if you want to make this transition, you've got to look at the whole economy. What is the economy? Um, and when you think about it, this is a physicist's view of the economy, I suppose. The economy is a machine that takes stuff and knowledge and energy and transforms them. It sucks entropy out of them and puts the entropy into the external system. Energy is right at the heart of that. And if you don't understand, and, and, and by the way, um, the, don't ask economists. I mean, how many economists are there in the room? Just before I completely burn my boats with all of you. I mean, I say this in a, in a friendly and wanting to build bridges kind of way. <laughs> but I don't think... I, don't, I, I think you know, one of the lessons of 2008 is that economists don't understand the economy as well as they thought they did. And I'll, I'll come back to that because it matters, it matters quite a lot. But it means we have no theory for this transition at the moment. There's a wonderful poem uh, by a Spanish um, poet, Machado Caminante, which I first heard at a meeting in County Clare organized by Eamon Ryan, who's sitting quietly there, a Caminante Pathfinder, and there's a line in that, Pathfinder, there is no path. The path is made by walking. We're going to have to do this by what the Marxists call praxis. We're going to have to build the theory as we move along, because we don't have a proper theory at the moment. Um, and the theory we need to build, as I've said, is a theory about how the economy works. It's not a theory about climate technology. Uh, so I want to say a word about that. You have a commentator here. He's quite respected, I believe. I don't quite know how to sort of position him. Uh, Fintan O'Toole. He's not a sort of headbanger kind of ranting sort of commentator. Um, so you kind of would take him semi-seriously if you... And I was... I just looked him up. I wanted to educate myself about this problem. You're, ha you're having a little bit of difficulty over water pricing, I believe, in Ireland at the, at the moment. And he wrote an op-ed on, on the water issue in which he said, and I quote, a significant part of the population has ceased to feel that the state is theirs, um, that it tries its best to treat them with care and dignity. 
And he said, as a result of that, Ireland is heading towards ungovernability with no sense of common purpose, no sense of public interest. Does anybody disagree profoundly with that view? Just, I can't see many hands going up. That's, that's really quite, quite interesting. That's true in most member states of the European Union. Uh, I thought it wasn't true in Germany. I thought Germany, life in Germany was a bit more comfortable than ever, but I was in Berlin for a week, a couple of weeks ago, and you can see the signs of it. You can see the signs of it getting stronger there as well. So let, let me dwell for a moment on the British economy. The British economy is about 20% smaller than it should have been by now without the crash. 20% smaller than the models would have told you to expect in early 2008. Uh, real incomes in Britain are 10% less than they were then. We've had the longest sustained period of falling real incomes that we've had since records began, since the mid-19th since the mid -19th century, and probably for a lot, uh, for a lot longer. Um, uh, and the point is, we thought we had a compass. We thought we understood how the economy worked. We thought we understood the relationship between policy and prosperity. And what 2008 revealed is that we don't, or at least to put it in a slightly more academic way, the economy under current circumstances is in a place where many of the assumptions that gave us that original compass are breaking down. It's a bit, to take a physics analogy, it's a bit like physics towards the end of the 19th century, where you were starting to look at the very small, where quantum physics starts to bite and the very large and the very fast where relativity applies. So the compass, we thought we had a compass, but actually we don't. And the trouble is people, people realize that. People realize that all of those economists who are mostly men in suits don't actually know as much as they, as they claim to know about how to make our lives better. We thought, we thought we had a thing called progress. When I was a student, I and my generation just took it for granted that things would keep on getting better, that there were enough grown-ups in charge who knew what they were doing and could be relied on that things would keep getting better. I do a lot of this kind of speaking with groups of students in Britain now, and I often ask them, do you believe in progress? Do you think your lives will be better than your parents' lives? Not many people do. I would say about 5% normally when I ask that question. Belief in the enlightenment story of progress, which has dominated our lives for several hundred years, uh, is, is collapsing. That's a, that's a really serious, really serious problem. We thought we had a growth model. We thought we had a way of running the economy which would give us progress, which would, as it were, take the proceeds of growth and reinvest enough of them in maintaining the conditions for further growth. That was what New Labour was about in, in Britain, actually. That's gone. What we realize is we, the, the growth model that we, thought to have, that we thought we had is a model based on plunder. I'm sorry to use, use um, such direct language, but it's a growth model in which those who have been able to accumulate sufficient wealth and sufficient power have become, have become very skilled in using their position to accumulate more wealth and more power at the expense of everybody else, and the everybody else have noticed, and they're getting angry. And at the same time, and this is less, much less widely noticed, this is why this is a discussion about, <clears throat> about the economy and not the climate in a way, um, that same plunder takes place from the, what, what you might call the ecological foundation, the resource base, uh, the climate system, the, the um, the ecosystems on which we depend. We're also plundering uh, from those. And that's why we have a climate problem. And that's in a way what we need to, that's what we need to fix. Now you would have thought that in the face of all of that, the people who had been relying on what turned out to be a broken com uh, compass would be putting on a bit of sackcloth and daubing a few ashes on their foreheads and walking up and down the public streets saying, look, we're really sorry. You know, we did believe in this. It was in good faith, but actually we got it wrong. 
we were wrong and we need to build something different. And please join us in a conversation about how to build something different. You would have thought that that might be happening. I don't know if it's happening in Ireland, but it's not happening in Britain. It really is. What's happening in Britain? There was a cartoon in the Financial Times, which I rather liked, by a cartoonist called Banks, quite a good cartoonist, just in the immediate aftermath of the fall of Lehman Brothers. And it was the emperor with no clothes. It had the emperor sitting in his throne room, crown on his head but no clothes, and all of his courtiers gathered around him. And he was sitting on his chair naked, as if he was at the steering wheel of a car. And he was saying to his courtiers, never mind about my new clothes, check out my new car. There wasn't a car. That's where they are. That's where they are. They're still trying to use the old compass. That's sort of why I left the government. I did six years as a climate envoy, and I, it was a privilege to have that. It was a wonderful role to have, and it was a privilege to have it. But in the end, it was to, you can't do diplomacy if you're not doing at home what you're trying to get other countries, other societies to do. And because we were so desperately clinging with sort of zombie, with a zombie grip to the levers of business as usual, that was just breaking down. That's why I left and decided to begin this life as an independent um, <coughs> pontificator. Um, so um, we have emission control. We have a bit of a problem in the in the economy. Um, I would say it's more like 10, actually, but, but uh, <laughs> never mind. Um, uh, where does the low-carbon piece fit into that? Seems to me it's quite important. What do we need to do in Britain? Um, I, I won't, it's presumptuous to offer opinions about Ireland, but I can offer opinions about my own country. Problem number one, we need to get the emphasis away from the speculative economy back on the real economy. We need to get the emphasis beyond the southeast back into our heartland. We need to get off the hook of oil and gas. We need to make our economy less vulnerable to volatile international markets in, in oil and gas uh, and potentially to blackmail by people like Mr. Putin. We need to get innovation back into our economy. Our infrastructure needs a massive makeover. It seems to me, if you say we're going to restructure our energy system in a generation, you can do all of those things, or at least it gives you assets, it gives you resources with which to do all of those things. Um, on Tyneside, where I grew up, Tyneside was ecologically and economically dead for a very long time. It was rust belt, it was coal and steel and ships. Tyneside is now coming back to life on the back of low carbon supply chains. Uh, Siemens has got a major servicing facility for its offshore wind tur turbines in the North Sea. There's, biomass is controversial, but there's one of Europe's largest facilities for processing and transshipment of uh, biomass. Uh, there's Nissan exporting not only the electric uh, leaf, but high efficiency internal combustion engine cars from, uh, from South Shields. Um, and you can feel optimism coming back. You can feel the spring coming back into people's steps. You can feel it in other, other um, old industrial towns and ports down the East Coast. Hull and Humberside is another very good example. Um, it's doing some of those things uh, that we need. And I just wonder whether there are some opportunities here in Ireland. You have some great natural advantages. You're small. You, you, you don't, you're not such a complex economy. You're not a carbon intensive economy anyway. You have a very strong agricultural and food sector, which I'm not going to talk about too much, but, but actually agriculture, food and land use is right at the heart of this. And you've got massive assets there. You've got an educated population. And you've got something that seems to be really exciting, which is the potential for a controlled collision between the new digital economy and the new energy economy. Because this transformation is going to be as much about digitization as it's going to be about energy. If you do the digitization, you can use energy with much more precision, you can do it in a much more responsive way, and you can do it in a much more efficient way. And you've got, as I say, massive advantages there. Just a couple more minutes and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, in the end, it's about politics.
This is transformation, and you can't make any transformation work unless politics is working. And politics in Britain isn't working, and I'm gonna, what I'm going to say may sound a bit bleak, but actually it's not. It's just an attempt to be honest, because you can't fix something unless you're honest about the nature of the problem. But we have a number of problems in our political culture. We have a tendency uh, in our mainstream parties and in the media to treat politics as an exercise in managing the headlines rather than running the country. So the public is presented, presented with a sort of constant shifting succession of moving images that bear little relation to reality but are all attempts to shape public perceptions in pursuit of political advantage. The public thinks there are far more immigrants in Britain than there actually are, because in the headlines, that's the impression that's deliberately created. The public thinks there are far more benefit scroungers in Britain than there actually are, and that benefit fraud is a much bigger problem. That's a problem in the headlines, but it's what publics believe. Um, in any political challenge, the first reflex of the mainstream, of mainstream politics is not to think, how can we bring, together, bring people together? How can we rally people around a collective response to the challenge? What people do is reach for a wedge. How can we divide who's friend, who's enemy? How can we deepen the divisions in our country? At a time when actually the British public is thirsty and hungry for politicians who will talk to them about how we can come together uh, as a country. We still talk obsessively about growth but at the heart of the way we talk about growth is a lie. And that lie is actually, you go off and ask your friends in business what's good for growth, and they tell you what's good for them. And then you pretend that's good for the economy as a whole. And sometimes it may be good for the economy as a whole, but oftentimes it isn't. It's just rent seeking, which many of the people who are close to politics in business are very, uh, are very skilled at. Um, there's a pretty cynical attitude in politics towards promises. It's, I, I think it's not, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. It would be an absolute tragedy, and, and I, I hope it doesn't happen. And I will do everything I can, and I hope all of my countrymen people will do the same to avoid it. But it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that within 10 years, the UK will have left the European Union, and Scotland will have left the UK. What happened on the 18th of... September was the start of the Scottish question, not the end of the Scottish question. And one reason it was the start because it, it was because of what happened at seven o'clock in the morning on the 19th of, of September. What happened at seven in the morning on the 19th of September is that our Prime Minister went on the TV and he said to the people of Scotland, you know that solemn vow we made, if you vote no, you can have home rule, genuine home rule, no ifs, no buts. Well, actually, there's this thing called the English question that we need to sort out. And what was heard in Scotland was actually now there are some ifs and some buts, all about solving the English question, English votes for English laws. That is cynical and manipulative and lacks integrity. And that's a real problem because the people in Scotland, but also the people in England, feel that. And on top of everything else, there is no vision. In the book of Proverbs, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And there is no conversation in Britain about what kind of country we want to be and how to get there. There's not even a conversation. It's why that story about Northumbria is actually quite important. There's no conversation about where we were, who we were and where we came from. And you can't talk about where you want to get to unless you go back to those stories about where we came from. So I think if you want to take the opportunities, which are enormous opportunities, that arise from the climate problem and the response to the climate problem, you have to attend to how we fix politics. We all have a feeling that politics is something that is done not with us, but to us. And unless we find ourselves in the next few years living in countries where, after all, once again, we feel that politics is something that's done with us, then we haven't got a prayer of keeping climate change within two degrees. If we use the climate issue in the right way, an issue that affects everybody, an issue before which, in a sense, everybody is equal, if we learn to talk about climate change in a politically compelling way, 
then it can help renew our politics as well. And that's the challenge for all of you, because you probably feel that politics is something that is done to you. But you're not in the audience. You're actors on the stage. We're all actors on this stage, and what we get will depend on how we, how we say the lines that it's given to us to say. We need a period of humility. We need a period of contrition. We need a period of catharsis. And if our establishments don't volunteer any of that, then we need to force it on them. That's why my reaction as an outsider and a friend to the water issue is that actually there's something that goes right to the heart of the matter on this. It's an opportunity to trigger that catharsis. You can say you have your, your politicians besieged in their cars for hours on end by angry crowds. Now you can say they're Trotskyists. You can say they're being unreasonable. You can say they're blaming the establishment when actually it was everybody's fault. And in a sense, all of those things up to a point are true, but they don't solve the problem. You can, you can, you can, you can be right in politics without getting your way. And actually, we all, need to, we all need to understand there is no path. We make the path by walking. Transformation starts with all of us. So stop focusing in a narrow technocratic sense on climate technology and take your take what you feel, what you believe, into the politics of your country and reshape the politics of your country. Thank you all very much.